Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak over here. Um, I'm going to speak to you a little bit about uh, less invasive techniques for valve replacement and finish up with some information about the new sutureless valves that are uh, that have been used in Europe for some time and are now uh, uh, available in the United States. One of them is. So this was an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, in 1999. New keyhole heart surgery has arrived with fanfare, but was it premature? And the reaction of the Texas Medical Center from Dr. Cooley was it, it was a stunt. They took something awfully simple and made it simply awful. Well, following that, following that, in the ensuing decade, there were numerous publications, and I'll just run through them just to, uh, this is a very small sampling of them. NYU in 2003, the Brigham in 2004, again, NYU 2006, uh, and so on. And they all basically showed that it was safe um, uh, to do the surgery using minimally invasive techniques, valvular surgery we're talking about here, both aortic and mitral, and the outcomes uh, in some cases uh, were better uh, than with conventional sternotomy approaches. Um, uh, a meta-analysis in 2011 uh, that was done by ISMIX and which is in their journal uh, comparing uh, less invasive techniques with sternotomy uh, concluded that the mortality is, is, is the same. Uh, overall, you have less blood transfusion, reduced length of stay, earlier extubation, less wound infection, sternal stability, uh, reduced AF uh, and earlier return to work and without question superior cosmetics and patient satisfaction. Unlike TAVR, the diseased valve is excised and replaced and you've got the proven durability of modern prosthetic valves, although of course as Matt Williams said earlier on, we are using newer valves now, making the assumption that they, uh, that they will uh, function in the way that, um, that some of the older valves have. Uh, uh, paravalvular leak is virtually non-existent. There isn't a surgeon around, I think, who would leave the operating room with a patient that has a paravalvular leak. We simply don't uh, accept that. Um, and it's much more cost-effective. Um, uh, this is a, uh, a study on cost uh, for TAVR that was done in Belgium a couple of years ago. And it still holds true, uh, as a matter of fact, because the, uh, because the cost of these devices has not dropped significantly, but there was at least a 20,000 euro difference per patient. And the cost of the valves, as you know, runs anywhere from 25 to $30,000, whereas a surgical um, aortic valve uh, runs roughly between five and $7,000 for a modern bioprosthetic valve. So that's, uh, that's a five to seven fold difference, which is very significant once you start applying it to a large group of uh, people. Um, so this is a conventional approach. Uh, this is a sternotomy, and you can see that uh, uh, this is a surgeon's view. So the, uh, uh, the head of the patient is on the, on the left, and, uh, and the feet would be to the right. And of course, you've had a sternotomy. You've got all the tubes that are in there uh, that are necessary in order to do the, uh, to, to do the, uh, the, uh, the valve operation uh, safely. With, uh, with, uh, with the advent of TAVR, of course, so you've got transcatheter techniques, but I would posit that in the middle, there is the availability now um, uh, in, uh, for you to be able to perform um, uh, this operation uh, using much smaller, less invasive techniques. And in fact, um, this is uh, a, a view of that same open chest with the head on the left and the, and the feet on the right. Um, and uh, with the less invasive approach, uh, you get the view that you need to have of the aortic valve without, without seeing um, everything else. Uh, some things have facilitated the use of less invasive approaches and certainly the development of single shafted instruments which have a very low profile has been very useful. And uh, certain devices, and this is a core knot device that basically allows you to fasten sutures using a titanium knot fastener instead of having to tie in a hole. And this is a little thing that we did on the bench uh, to see um, uh, what the core knot uh, uh, device looked like on a modern trifecta valve. We were concerned that there may be some uh, uh, impingement on the leaflets, and we showed that there wasn't. Uh, but this shows you what it looks like uh, once it's been used to secure the sutures uh, around the circumference of the prosthesis. Uh, 
Imaging is increasingly useful now in helping to plan um, uh, approaches for minimally invasive surgery. Obviously, everybody's anatomy is slightly different, and it's important to be as precise as one can in the placement of incisions and um, uh, approaching whatever it is you want to do, whether it's a valve, aortic mitral, or whether it's coronary bypass surgery. And this is a paper that was just published this month in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery uh, uh, from Poland, uh, showing how they have used um, uh, uh, computed, uh, sorry, CTA uh, uh, specifically to plan the incisions for right anterior thoracotomy aortic valve replacement. And essentially what they were doing was um, uh, looking at the angle um, uh, from the annulus to the second or the third intercostal space and using that to decide whether they, they were going to enter uh, through the second or the third intercostal space. We haven't actually started using this, um, uh, but I have sent the paper to uh, uh, our imaging colleagues and I uh, uh, fully intend to see if this is something that would be useful. Uh, this is a short movie, about two minutes uh, long, that, that shows you our current technique for doing this operation. Um, and. Uh, uh, the patient's head is on the left and the feet to the right. We've entered through the third intercostal space. Cannulation is done through the groin. We've got the aortic cross clamp on um, and cardioplegia is given to stop the heart. The um, aortic root is opened and the uh, diseased valve uh, is exposed. Uh, you can see that the view is very good uh, through this incision. Um, it's heavily calcified. Uh, this was a uh, tri-leaflet valve. The annulus is debrided very carefully to ensure that uh, it's, it's as compliant as possible and then sized. Sutures are placed. You see the single shafted instruments which really help a great deal. Uh, it seems like little things but there's lots of little things combined that make uh, that make the procedure easy to, to do. This is an Edwards Magna Ease uh, uh, bioprosthesis, one of a few that are available. And it's parachuted down. And here you see the use of the core knot, titanium knot fastener, which is very easy and quick to use has a very high burst strength. One of my nurses says, it's like highlights. Once you try it, there's no going back. <clears throat> Check the leaflets. Check to make sure that the coronaries aren't uh, occluded. And then you close up the um, aorta. Cross clamp comes off. And in this particular case, I had uh, uh, transected the, uh, the third rib in order to get more space. With a clean transection, we put it together with a plate and screws, and we use lots of uh, local anesthetic for postoperative pain relief. And that very same patient in the video, this is him uh, one month later. Uh, this is a procedure that is applicable in morbidly obese patients as well. Uh, the, the heaviest patient I've done is a 450 pound uh, gentleman who's actually a very well known patent attorney. This was one that we did more recently, a very heavy set individual. But you can see that in the, in the upper chest, even a morbidly obese patient, um, uh, uh, right up here, the, uh, the uh, chest wall is actually uh, much, well, fairly easily accessible. Um, and of course, you can imagine in a, in a patient like this doing a sternotomy um, uh, would, would carry a significant amount of morbidity. Uh, we have a somewhat modest experience over here of about 124 patients over the last, uh, uh, this is through the end of 2015, we've had no deaths. Uh, uh, five strokes, um, uh, four of which were minor, uh, with really no functional uh, um, um, uh, issue. Uh, one of them uh, was a major stroke. Four patients um, 
had five patients had acute renal failure, but none required dialysis after discharge, and uh, blood transfusion and atrial fibrillation was, uh, well, blood transfusion uh, was 21%, and in, in our normal cohort of patients, all, all comers at this institution, it's around 35 to 40%. But um, uh, uh, this is not to, this is not meant to act as a comparison. It's it's just a raw number for this for this group of patients. Atrial fibrillation, uh, to our surprise, was uh, was unchanged from the normal uh, sternotomy patients that we do, uh, and uh, much of the literature suggests that there is a reduced incidence of AFib in these patients. Uh, what about sutureless valves? These are the new valves, and uh, this is a McGovern Chromi valve from the 1960s, which is the first sutureless valve that was. Uh, 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 that was invented, and this was a tool uh, that's, that was used to uh, implant the valve, uh, and you can see those, those metal spikes on the outside. Uh, when you put the valve in, the spikes were, were, were sheathed, and then you'd use the tool, and the spikes would sort of come out and grab onto the annulus, and that was the whole idea that you could, this was a rapid deployment valve. I've actually taken out one of these, and it was very interesting. This was a few years ago. Um, in order to remove it, you need to have that tool. Um, and, uh, and so before we took the patient to the operating room, we actually conducted a search in the basement, and it turned out that in, in Dr. DeBakey's old uh, toolbox, they were able to find that, uh, find that uh, handle, and so we were able to explant the valve um, and put the new valve in. But basically, what you've got for sutureless valves now, uh, there were three valves that, uh, that, uh, uh, that were available. Uh, on the left, you see the, uh, the Edwards Intuity valve here. Uh, and this is the Sorin, uh, or Libanova, as it's now called, Percival valve. And on the right, the Medtronic 3F um, Enable valve. Um, this valve is now no longer available. Medtronic withdrew it from the market. There were some issues with valve migration, and uh, they said that they had fixed those issues, but they chose not to reintroduce the valve. So for practical purposes, really the two valves that are available are the Edwards Intuity and the, uh, and the, uh, and the Percival valve. The Percival valve uh, has just been approved uh, in the United States in uh, February this year by the FDA. Uh, and the Intuity valve has not yet been approved, but we expect that to happen later this year. There's an extensive European experience with this uh, uh, showing excellent outcomes, and this little schematic shows you how the Edwards Intuity valve is delivered. It's on a holder, and you have three guiding sutures that you place through the valve, and you slide it down, you tie those sutures. You have to um, use a balloon to expand it. So it's really a combination of their surgical valve, the Edwards Magna Ease that I showed you earlier, and their uh, uh, Sapien valve. They've blended the two technologies to create this valve, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is easily uh, deployed. And uh, their, their um, outcomes in one study in Europe, uh, and this has been confirmed by many other studies, have shown that, that the cross-clamp times are, are significantly lower. Um, and also patient prosthesis mismatch is something which is, uh, which is non-existent with this valve uh, because the effective orifice area for any given patient annulus with the sutureless valves is higher, uh, significantly higher than the, than the uh, currently available stented valves. The Percival uh, S, which is the one that's available here in the US, has a um, um, uh, radially collapsing profile. You have to collapse the valve on the back bench like you do for a Tavro valve. Uh, and this means that you have superior visibility because it's a low profile as you're inserting it into the root, short learning curve um, uh, with excellent clinical outcomes. It's just been approved. And um, it, uh, it has the other feature um, uh, of being a, um, a very um, compliant uh, alloy. It's sort of a cage that, uh, that is very compliant, unlike the Edwards Intuity valve, which is a rigid uh, annulus. And of course, this, um, uh, this, uh, this allows the valve, this is the uh, um, Percival valve that you see, uh, and you can appreciate as the valve opens, how the annulus, in fact, distends, and this allows it to conform to the dynamic nature of the, of the uh, aortic root during systole and uh, diastole. We don't know if it makes a clinical significance, but intuitively, it seems to be a good thing. Uh, you use three sutures to guide it down, just like you do uh, with the Edwards valve, but then you remove these sutures. You don't have to tie them down. Um, and this is a valve that, this is uh, the first one that we put in just last month. Uh, uh, myself and uh, uh, Dr. Reardon, we had a proctor uh, come in. Uh, 
this is a minimally invasive approach and you excise the, uh, uh, we did this through a upper sternotomy as the, uh, 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 for the initial cases, they, they, uh, they want you to use a sternal approach, either upper or full sternal approach. You excise the diseased valve um, and size it. It comes in three sizes, small, medium, and large. And uh, this is what the valve looks like. Um, it is crimped on the back table. I didn't show that. And you've got the guiding sutures. <coughs> Down into the annulus and <clears throat> check to make sure it's well seated. Remove the retaining clip and pop. That's it. <clears throat> you take it out and then you uh, it is night and all and so you'll see us putting warm saline on there uh, in order to maximize the expansion of the frame that we can achieve at the time of implantation this is a balloon that they advise that you use um, to uh, to make sure that it's uh, that it conforms as well as possible to the uh, patient's annulus. Um, several papers, but the most recent one in 2014, um, uh, looking at the Percival valve in Europe, uh, uh, compared uh, two groups of patients uh, having conventional and suture-less approaches. Uh, there were 133 pairs of propensity match patients, and there was a dramatic reduction in pump time, clamp time, similar mortality, and a dramatic reduction in post-operative ventilation, and, uh, and also the size of the prosthesis that they were able to implant um, was much larger for the sutureless valves. Uh, this has been confirmed with a multi-center European experience. The hemodynamics of the valve are excellent. They, are, they, they mimic the hemodynamics of TAVR valves, which is not surprising when you look at the construction of the valve itself. So that itself is a very appealing characteristic. It's also been shown, unsurprisingly, uh, in Europe uh, um, over, a, over a period of years that, uh, that as, as people uh, increased, um, uh, um, as these valves became available uh, to surgeons in Europe, uh, the, uh, the adoption of minimally invasive approaches also increased because it's just easier to deploy this valve um, um, through a smaller incision. Uh, it's obviously very useful in combined procedures and complex cases where the rapid deployment characteristics shorten the time required to do this, and so this is something which is now routinely done in Europe for combined procedures. And the larger effective orifice areas uh, allows valve and valve even in the smallest sizes. And I'm sure all of you have, have heard and probably even have uh, the, the BAPIT app. And, uh, and this was taken uh, from that app where you can see that even for the small size of the Percival valve, uh, it is possible to implant a 23 sapien or a 23 core valve. Um, shorter length of stay reduces cost, uh, which is intuitive, and this is a, uh, this is a study from Europe uh, that demonstrated just that. And so in summary, uh, you have a reduction of cross clamp and, and uh, bypass times, improved outcomes. Um, it's useful for concomitant procedures, uh, shortens, it has generally short learning curves. We were surprised after the first one how, how easy it was to actually place this, and it certainly um, uh, facilitates minimally invasive approaches. So the keys to success for minimally invasive cardiac surgery is teamwork. This is extremely important, but bears, uh, bears um, uh, mentioning um, uh, at the top of the list. Good visualization using a head cam or a thoracoscope so that the entire team can see. Uh, uh, I haven't, I didn't go through cannulation strategies, but that's a whole different uh, thing altogether. And it's very important to be thoughtful and careful about your cannulation strategies, myocardial preservation, the appropriate use of new tools and technologies. And training is probably the most difficult aspect as this isn't really taught in fellowships. Um, and um, a culture of safety. This is something that I emphasize to everybody. We have a low threshold for conversion. It's your safety net. Patient safety always comes first. 
So um, minimally invasive approaches, I think, uh, uh, certainly achieve results that are at least as good uh, without the need for a sternotomy. Uh, the techniques for these procedures are well established. Most patients needing surgical aortic valve replacement now can have a minimally invasive approach, isolated surgical aortic valve replacement, not combined procedures, including morbidly obese patients and those with aortoiliac disease. Mm -hmm. Here are some, some of those patients that we've operated upon, and this was the gentleman whose video I showed you. We teach these techniques at um, um, this and other techniques for minimally invasive cardiac surgery here. Uh, at a meeting that we hold uh, every year in the spring, and this was the most recent one just last month. I think you should change with the times, there's less is more.